นะมวยจะสาปะกวะตัวอะระหะตัวสัมมาสัมบุทธะสานะมวยจะสาปะกวะตัวอะระหะตัวสัมมาสัมบุทธะสานะมวยจะสาปะกวะตัวอะระหะตัวสัมมาสัมบุทธะสาพุทธังดัมมังสังขังนัมมาสามีโซ่ก็ดีวันนี้ทุกคนและขอบคุณทุกคนที่มาร่วมงานกันวันนี้เป็นโอกาสที่ดีที่จะฟังธรรมะอย่างที่ทราบก็คืออาทิตย์ตุลาคมดังนั้นเป็นวันปกติของคนไทยแต่วันนี้วันนี้ไม่มีใครเข้าใจเป็นเวลาในตัวเองในบ้านเองในบ้านของคุณหรือในวันพฤหัสบดีเราก็มีการจัดงานปฏิบัติธรรมบุรุษของไทยและปรเทศในอเมริกาและประเทศอเมริกาที่เป็นบุรุษดังนั้นเป็นเวลาของปีที่ดีที่สุดที่เราจะได้มาร่วมงานกันในที่นี้เราจะได้มาร่วมงานกันในที่นี้เราจะได้มาร่วมงานกันในที่นี้เราจะได้มาร่วมงานกันในที่นี้เราจะได้มาร่วมงานกันในที่นี้ Particularly to meet as families um, and remember with gratitude and appreciation those people who have helped us. For those of you familiar with the um, Buddhist ceremonies, when we have a New Year ceremony, it's traditional to offer flowers um, to elders and teachers. And to bathe the hands of elders and teachers, and this water pouring ceremony, bathing the hands of people we uh, love and respect, it symbolizes the goodness of our heart, the kindness, the gratitude, the appreciation. In Buddhism, water is often symbolic of um, the warmth, the radiance. The clarity, the coolness of the heart, and when we have those qualities of gratitude, appreciation, well, that, that's what flows out of our heart. So that symbolizes by pouring the water or the goodness of our heart over the hands of somebody we respect or have gratitude to. So that could be parents, grandparents, and teachers. So in the monasteries, we always uh, begin that ceremony when we have it with pouring water over the Buddha statue um, to remember the Buddha, our teacher, and perhaps even more so than ever this year with the state of the world, uh, the spread of COVID-19 virus, and the restrictions uh, our society has placed on ourselves at this time. Some of the teachings that the Buddha gave seem ever more relevant, more pertinent, more useful to us as human beings. You know, the wisdom of the Buddha is timeless, and so our gratitude to the Buddha is always there because we're seeing over and over again what the Buddha taught has been proven to be true. Whether you're a scientist uh, in the medical profession or any walk of life. Uh, or you're a Buddhist practitioner. You know, what you probably are finding in your life, if you put these Buddhist teachings into practice, is that they're true. They really do uh, point to the truth and help us to understand ourselves and our role in the world and how to relate to the world wisely. So that's something that brings up gratitude, appreciation. So when we have um, these Buddhist New Year ceremonies, we usually Do various things like pouring water, offering flowers, to express that. Another way the Buddha encouraged us to express our gratitude, gratitude for his teachings is actually through the practice, what we call pati pati puja, putting them into practice in our life for our own benefit and well-being, but also you might say to prove to everyone, to ourselves, to everyone that what the Buddha 
taught is true and is really useful and beneficial for us as human beings. So that's what we do every night when we come together to chant, meditate and hear the Dhamma. We're putting these Buddhist teachings into practice. There's some different aspects, you might say a core aspects of what the Buddha taught. Um, one of them is to recognize the fact that as human beings we can change ourselves, the way we think, our attitudes, our views, our behavior, our habits, our minds. We can change, we can cultivate and develop our minds for the better. And that opportunity and that potential is always there. And the Buddhist teachings are founded on this fact, is that human beings have this potential to learn from their experience and improve their experience all the time, that's always available to us. And you'll notice when you have stress or suffering in life, often one of the feelings you have is that there's nothing you can do, you're stuck. Uh, sometimes we feel like it's always going to be like this, whether it's some form of depression, some feeling of failure, anxiety, worries about our future or the people we love or the things we're doing and so on. We feel stuck in that experience. But what the Buddha pointed out is that human beings can always change and improve themselves. Nothing is fixed, nothing is, um, nothing has to be the way it, it is all the time. We can improve things, we can change things for the better if we make wise choices and put them into practice in our life. So you could say that is the beginning of the Buddhist practice. It's just this awareness that human beings can learn, can develop, can improve themselves. And that underpins, underlies our faith and confidence in what the Buddha taught. And the second core part of the Buddhist practice and the Buddhist teachings is that it's a good idea to associate with people who are, are practicing and doing these things meeting with, associating with, spending time with people who practice what the Buddha taught. Um, particularly people who have, we say, realized the Dhamma. People who have understood the truth, put it into practice and freed themselves from a lot or indeed all of their stress and suffering. Um, because if you spend time and associate with them, listen to them, those kind of people, then you get very good examples you get good uh, advice, wisdom, knowledge and if you continue to associate, spend, spend your time with uh, good people, wise people, people who are putting effort into this practice, well you'll get a lot of support in your own practice, you'll get um, ideas and knowledge that you can use in your own practice from the people you associate with. So it's important to think about this this is one reason why we go to temples and monasteries, but of course at the moment we can't, so maybe this is why you turn on your Facebook and uh, watch this broadcast or any other teachings that are going on in the mo at the moment on the internet. That's a way you can associate with fellow practitioners and get a lot of support in your own practice, in your own life. Um, human beings are social beings, so when we spend time with each other we can help each other influence each other in a good way. Another core principle in Buddhist teachings is you know, our actions, what we do, and particularly you know, how we use this physical body, the kind of actions, the kind of things we do in our life. Um, our actions are obviously driven by our mind, what we think, what we intend to do, but also, we should observe and learn from physically how we're spending our time, what we're doing with ourselves. And this is a great period, you know, even though we're all under stress and many people unfortunately are suffering with illness. Uh, in fact, that's nothing new. We've had illness in the world since day one. But it's a good opportunity at this time in particular when we're practicing you know, isolation, social distancing, spending more time at home, 
maybe spending more time on our own, we can learn from this and learn how we are treating this body, how we are using this body. It's a good time to experiment and find out you know, how much food do you need to eat in a day to be healthy, to be comfortable. How much sleep do you need? Uh, the kind of activities you're involved with, how skillful they are and what kind of results do they have on your sense of well-being, your physical well-being, your mental well-being. So how much you interact with other people and the way you interact with other people, what you say, what you do with others, how you use um, social media, how you use communications, uh, what are you communicating to others and how are you using your time. This is a part of our daily practice, but particularly at this time when we are at home more, we can use that time to study ourselves and really take it as something that you can learn about and get a really good understanding of what is conducive to your well-being and happiness and also how you can contribute to the well-being and happiness of others. Um, maybe some people at this time are learning how to re-engage with their families or the people around them because when the world was, say, a few months ago was functioning more or less normally, um, you know, we're running around every day doing our jobs, going here, doing our activities, going there. Often we have that sense we've got no time for anything. We've got, just got to get on and, and finish our list of activities and do all the things we plan to do. But now a lot of that has been disrupted or even cancelled and finished. So now we've actually got more time on our hands perhaps. And this is a time you can look at how to spend your time wisely and maybe you know, you're back at home with your family and you might realise you haven't actually spent much time with your family in the past or you haven't actually spent quality time with them or had much communication or interaction with your partner, with your children, with your immediate f family or friends. Maybe this is a time to put more into that and you'll get more out of it. One of the things the Buddha pointed out is that when we interact with other people, if we are l considering their happiness and well-being as well as ourselves, we tend to be happier as human beings. Often when we are busy doing our jobs, doing our activities, you know, we tend to be just thinking of ourselves and getting the next thing done. But when you have to slow down, take a new look at, our, at your life, um, because, say because of the current situation, well you might notice maybe there's opportunities that are there to do more for other people around you and take more interest in the people around you. And it's no loss and it's no hardship to yourself. It actually can be a cause for your own happiness and their happiness and benefit as well. So this is what I mean by uh, taking more interest in you know, how we use this body uh, and how we interact with the people around us. The last one, which is very closely related to that, the Buddha pointed out, is our mind. You know, how, how are we? You know, what's our state of mind from day to day? How are we using our mind? What are we thinking about? What kind of emotional states are we experiencing? This is something uh, you can learn, especially when you're practicing um, social distancing, you're traveling less, doing less things outside of your house, outside of your immediate area, location. You can really watch your mind much better than usual, perhaps. You, f you might feel you have more time available. So it's a great time to practice some meditation, mindfulness, bring up that quality of paying attention to yourself as a human being, getting to know yourself better, watching your mind and learning, well, what are you thinking about every day? What are the qualities of your, your state of mind? Uh, are you inclining more towards the virtuous, skillful qualities that bring you more peace, more happiness? Or are you getting caught up in the negativities of life, reacting to things with negative emotions perhaps, uh, the complaining mind, finding fault with yourself, finding fault with those around you. 
which is one common reaction when we're cut off from the things we like or the things we're used to. Suddenly we find ourselves in a situation where we, we can't go out or we can't um, engage in entertainments or sports or social things that we want to do and so on. The mind very easily goes towards negativity, frustration, maybe looks to take that out on somebody else. See if you can turn that around by, by practicing more mindfulness, more awareness and see the harm of negative states of mind and how they lead on to negative speech, negative actions. And to do that, you need to develop more self-awareness. And we do that both in what we call formal meditations, so sitting, walking meditation techniques that we practice, and also just general mindfulness and reflecting on what you're doing moment by moment through your day. So these are four aspects to the Buddhist practice, the Buddhist teachings that you can see relate to daily life. You know, just having that self-confidence and belief in your own potential for change, for improvement. Uh, mixing and spending time with like-minded people who practice the Dhamma and particularly teachers and good examples. Um, paying more attention to how you use your body, this physical body, what you're doing with it, and then the mind that drives everything. You know, what, what are the qualities of mind, what are the intentions, what are the states of mind that you're um, getting involved with and are coming up into your mental experience day by day. One of the offerings and the things that the, the monastery and the monastic life, monks and nuns, who practice in this kind of environment. One of the things they can offer to the world is you know, insights based on doing this regularly. You know, say for most of the world, the practice of social distancing, social isolation is maybe just a temporary thing and a very new thing for many people. Well, of course, Buddhist monastics have been doing this for thousands of years. It's quite normal for us. We understand it very well, so it's not that much of a disruption to what we're doing. Um, maybe it is in a small way, maybe the monks are worried whether anyone's going to offer any food tomorrow, I don't know. But generally speaking, we're used to this. Um, and there's many things you can learn from the monastic form and the practices we do. So one thing that these uh, Facebook um, live stream um, streaming sessions that we've been doing has brought up is people have asked about bowing. And they notice Buddhist monks and nuns bow a lot. We bow when we come into a hall. We bow when we leave the hall. We bow to a teacher. We bow when we uh, sit in front of a Buddha statue and so on. And this is the way our teacher Ajahn Chah taught us to practice in the monastery. We bow. It's one of the things Buddhist monks and nuns do. Why do we bow? Well, there's many benefits, there's many reasons. Um, to cut to the heart of it, Lumpur Cha used to say, when you're bowing, you're letting go of self, ego. You're diminishing, reducing your attachment to the idea and the sense of self, if only a little. Um, because physically, you're humbling yourself. When you bow, we, you'll notice we bow down. Uh, we put our he forehead on the floor in front of us, we kneel, we put the forehead down and then the arms down either side of the head. So you're physically humbling yourself to what? Um, well, it's to those qualities and virtues that you aspire to. So when you bow in front of a Buddha statue, you're recollecting these wholesome qualities, the compassion, the wisdom, the peacefulness, the purity of mind of the Buddha. And the way we say it is we incline towards those qualities. So not only inclining our mind, but inclining our body physically. Um, another very useful benefit of bowing is that you're learning to pause or interrupt the flow of all that mental chatter and all that craving, attachment, um, the trains of thought that are going on all the time. If you bow, you have to physically stop, kneel down, bow three times. And as you physically stop mentally, you pause as well. And if you bow many times in a day, 
uh, as we do, that means many times in a day you're pausing your mind, you're bringing up mindfulness of body and your mental state at that time. And those m many occasions, you know, they, they feed into each other, they support the arising of mindfulness over and over again. Related to the bowing, we have um, this practice of Anjali, where we put our hands together like this, and you'll notice many Buddhists do this when they greet, as opposed to the handshake, and even world leaders now are adopting it because it's a very healthy thing to do, to way to greet other people at this time when there's a lot of uh, disease about. But it's also a very peaceful sign when you put your hands in Anjali, you're showing respect for the other person, you're showing that your hands are there, you're not holding a weapon, or uh, you're focused on that person at that moment when you do that gesture. So whether it's bowing or Anjali, it's a very good way of developing wholesome states of mind. So in the monastery, uh, a junior monk will always bow to a senior monk in a you know, formal situation. When I say junior, that can be junior by one day, you know, one ordained one day after, or it could be 30 years after. Doesn't matter, we bow to, to monks who are more senior to us. And another thing Lumpur Cha pointed out with this is that it, it's a great leveler, uh, a great way to let go of your attachment to your own personality, who you think you are, who you feel you are, your attachment to your ego, your pride, your conceit. And also, it's a practice of gratitude, respect to the Buddha, and respect to that person you're bowing to. And you'll notice, you notice, know, if you bow many times in your life, say, as we do as monks, you know, there'll be some people you know, some people you don't, but you bow to them just because they're maybe more senior to you. There may be somebody you really love and respect as a friend. There may be somebody you don't really like or don't, don't get on well with, but you still bow. It's something you learn to do, whatever. And so if you're practicing bowing, or sometimes the Anjali, what it means is you're constantly restraining any anger, ill will, um, conceit that might come up. And so even if there's somebody you don't particularly like or get on well with, if you can still bow to them or show them respect, that develops a great sense of warmth and harmony in the community. Uh, it's a great way to let go of past um, anger or ill will, things from the past that may have divided us. And it's helping you to get through to the deeper um, realization of the Dhamma that you know this thing we call a person that we base on personality view and attachment to that. It's a fantasy. It's a creation of the mind. So it's, sometimes it's a kind of a leveler of this in your mind. You know, if you can bow to everyone or see the goodness and have some respect to everyone, then you're letting go of some of your own attachment. It's actually helping you, even though it's not always easy to do. And Jen Cha is very famous for this. You know, sometimes, uh, like when I was a young monk, there was one senior monk in the region who was in the administration and the Sangha had to go and bow to that monk uh, at least once a year and sometimes more than that. And he, for some reason, didn't really like Ajahn Chah. Perhaps he felt forest monks, meditation monks, weren't completely fulfilling their duties in terms of study because um, some monks do more study, some do more meditation. That's a, um, a natural division, you might say, in the spiritual community. And so this monk seemed to be a little bit bias or critical of Ajahn Chah. There were some t sometimes he'd make comments. But Ajahn Chah always taught the monks to respect this senior monk, go and see him, visit him, bow to him. And Ajahn Chah already, always did that very beautifully. And the very first time I met that senior monk, I went to see him. Um, he even said a few words that were a bit critical of the group we went with to bow, but we still bowed to him and showed him respect. And it's something you feel you never regret, you know, even if somebody doesn't particularly like you, but you can still show them respect, kindness. That's a good thing for your practice and it's a good thing for the community. 
So the practice of bowing is very useful like this. It's a practice of body, speech and mind all in one, rolled in one. It's just one of those things you learn in the monastery uh, and you can even perhaps try it at home. You can bow to a Buddha statue or a picture of the Buddha or a teacher. When our monks, we go and stay out in the forest, sometimes we even um, you bow to the Buddha even though you're just camping under a tree. There's no statue, no picture, nothing around. You just bow to the picture or, or bow to the, the picture in your mind of the Buddha and those qualities that he embodies. Um, so it's something you can do anytime, any place, even though it's a bit un we're unfamiliar with it in, say, Australian culture. You can still do it um, once you be, uh, bring it into your practice. There was one time when uh, the King of Thailand came to Ajahn Chah's funeral, I remember, and he landed on a plane at the airport, Ubon Airport, the city where Ajahn Chah, near where Ajahn Chah lived. And then the king and queen uh, who were coming to preside over Ajahn Chah's funeral, they came out, out of the airport in a procession of a convoy of cars and lining the streets from the airport, both sides of the street, the, the population of the city and the surrounding areas came out to meet the uh, royal procession, and, but everybody knelt down when the king arrived or drove past. They all knelt down with their hands in Anjali and as the car passed, they all bowed to the car, which might seem a rather unusual thing in the world. And even in Thailand, that was quite unusual. You know, usually when the king travels, you get a big crowd lining the streets, but often they'll wave flags, cheer, and so on. But on that day, everyone went down t on their knees and bowed the whole way. And it's about 15 kilometers from the airport to the monastery. And the whole route was lined with people. So the king noticed this. And he asked one of his associates, um, his staff, he said, how come everyone is bowing so beautifully? And in the whole way, like kilometer after kilometer of people. And his um, staff member said, well, this is uh, Ajahn Chah's teaching. He taught these people how to show respect, how to be mindful and graceful in their behavior. And this is the result. And it's something that everybody remembers to this day, a very beautiful image of you know, thousands and thousands of people just bowing very gracefully. Another story I remember about bowing was when I was living with Lumpur Anand and Ajahn Mahabua came to visit a few times and one, on one occasion um, we were massaging him. You know, he'd given a talk and then he was having a rest and we were just massaging his legs because they get stiff when you get old and ch chatting with him and one of the monks was uh, rather brave and asked Lung Da, said, Lung Da, how did you get enlightened? And so the, the question was very bold, but he actually responded to it. He sat up, he'd been lying down, we were massaging his legs, he sat up and he gave us a talk all about the night of his enlightenment and his enlightenment experience, uh, which was very inspiring. Some monks even had tears in their eyes listening to it. And then the same monk, who was again very bold, um, said at the end of the talk, as everyone was very happy, inspired by hearing him tell about his practice on that night, the same monk asked him, so after an hour, one reaches the state of Arahant, total enlightenment, what next? What does the Arahant do? And again, uh, Ajahn Mahabha was very gracious and answered the question. He said, I bowed. After my enlightenment experience, I spent the rest of the night bowing to the Buddha, my teacher, out of gratitude. Um, so that's one qu question answered. You know, what does an arahant do after they're enlightened? Well, they remember with gratitude their teachers and they display it. And one way we display is bowing. And one of his teachers, Ajahn Sao, who was a friend of Ajahn Man, you may have heard of him, considered, another one considered an enlightened teacher. 
He's famous because, oh, for, he's famous for many reasons, but one of the uh, reasons he's well known is when he got very old, he got quite seriously ill, he'd been in Laos, and the monks brought him back to his monastery in Ubon because they knew he might pass away soon. And they had to carry him, he was so weak, and they carried him into the monastery and they were going to go to his hut in the forest to lay him down for a rest. But he said, before I uh, go to my hut, I'd like to go to the main Ubozata hall, the main hall in the monastery and bow to the Buddha statue, which is a custom when monks arrive at a monastery will tend to bow to the main statue of the monastery first. So they carried him into the hall and put him down in front of this large statue and he bowed. But he's very old, very frail and very sick. So he bowed once to the Buddha and he bowed twice to the Dhamma. And then on the third bow, he, his head went down to the ground and he just got stuck there in that position, bowing. And the monks around him were just waiting patiently out of respect for him to finish they thought maybe he was so weak he just couldn't get up. So they went over to him and touched him and found that he had died. He'd actually passed away bowing to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. So that's the state of mind of somebody who really uh, has practiced the Dhamma and the Dhamma has emerged in their mind. You know, what are they thinking of? They're thinking of the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. What do they respect? What do they love? They re respect and love the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. So tonight I've just given you a few um, ideas about the practice. Uh, I'll encourage you all to keep practicing. Um, I'm sure it will bring you benefit, happiness in your life. Um, it won't necessarily take away all the troubles and the problems in your life, but it might help you. The practice you do, the generosity, the virtues you develop, the mindfulness, the wisdom, this should help you to deal with some of the ups and downs of life and those unexpected changes which come along. Um, so, I'll end the talk there and wish you all well. So, Patti Bano, Bano, Bano,